This conference will now be recorded. Issues informally with staff and invited guests. The board encourages members of the public to attend work sessions and listen to the discussion, but there's generally no opportunity for public comment. Members of the public wishing to address the board are welcome to do so during the board's regularly scheduled meetings held twice monthly. So we'll start our uh, agenda with board communications. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, sir. I want to report success of weeding through 11,000 emails collected over six years of uh, service to Clatsop County. Um, I'm reminded that uh, that a commissioner's job consists of a whole lot of listening. And, and the intention when I listen is to bring out the best in people and to deal with um, anything else. So that's one point. The other thing is that the water district in my neighborhood voted Saturday unanimously as a board to disallow any public comment at their meetings. They are apparently um, legally entitled to do that. I raise that because um, a tree could fall on me tomorrow and I wanna make sure that my colleagues understand that that action was taken by the water board. Uh, we have a couple of folks who sit on that board who are asking that the county delegate authority to them to deal with um, various land use and short-term rental issues and so on. So I would ask my colleagues to bear that in mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Commissioner Bangs. Can you hear me? Okay. Can hear you. I'll try this. Okay, you can hear me? Okay. Um, well, I know along, along with all of probably all of you, you've received the same emails regarding the CAHOOTS model um, out of the Eugene area. And I proceeded this weekend to kind of do a little bit of research in regards to that. Um, and I'm going to continue to do so the next time I visit my family down there. I'm going to try to get in and actually visit with the police department to see their, their perspective in regards to that. Um, I am extremely supportive of anything in regards to improving our mental health um, availability resources to our constituents. And so I was curious and that's the rabbit hole I fell down <laughs> this week and, and I kind of enjoyed myself. I, I like research. Anyhow, um, that is basically what I've done uh, besides being iced in and without power for 48 hours. I have to say thank you to all of our public works employees. Thank you to all of our linemen and to my community members because we live in a pretty amazing community where most folks know how to use a chainsaw and we get out and we help each other. And that's what we've done over the last four days is get out and help each other, make sure, make sure they're fed. And that's what our tiny little town did um, in Napa this, this past week. So anyhow, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, we live in a wonderful community and everybody pulls together in, in times of need. So, uh, Commissioner Kuyoka. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, similar to Courtney, I was reading and doing a lot of research on that cahoots as well this week. So there's a lot of emails from the group and individually being sent to me about it. So I decided to, again, it's like uh, Commissioner Bangs, look into it. You know, a lot of questions come up when you read in there the history of CAHOOTS and how they established and uh, come up big concerns is, you know, if we open a discussion and bring it to agenda that, you know, funding, where does it come from? You know, the city of the police department in Eugene funds that program. Uh, then they also have contingencies of, you know, control. Who does that locally at the city level? Is it more appropriate for city or county? Uh, so a lot of questions can be raised on that. So, you know, the more we delve into it, I think the more we'll understand what they're trying to achieve. And then more importantly, you know, how many agencies, what's really involved and who pays for it and how do, they, how do we get there? I agree. Thank you, Commissioner Toyoka. And certainly want to have our sheriff's perspective and law enforcement <laughs> on a discussion about CAHOOTS. 
Correct. Commissioner Webb. Um, am I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Oh, oh, okay, I'm on, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I too uh, uh, um, was very struck by the CAHOOTS program and spent a good deal of time in the last week talking to people locally. Uh, went to their website, um, et cetera. I think this is a wonderful subject for us to get um, some of our local providers together uh, and, and, and talk about. Um, some of them were a little bit negative about the CAHOOTS program, but I, I just would like to hear everybody's opinions on it. Uh, and I too had, had some serious issues about the funding. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, the, the other thing I think that, um, that I, that struck me about the CAHOOTS program was that it's, it, clearly it's an urban based program. And one of the things that I am most concerned about, um, is our lack of mental health resources for people who live, uh, outside of our cities. Uh, we know uh, one of the people I spoke to this week were um, some of our domestic vi violence uh, folks, um, and I have had conversations with the sheriff about that, that, that in rural areas we have, um, especially since kids haven't been going to school, we know that there's been a rise in domestic violence and probably child abuse. Um, so how this model would work in our rural areas is something of great interest to me. Um, so I'd love to see us. I'm glad that we're, so many of us are, are motivated to, to look further into this because I think it's, I think it's a cool model to at least study. Um, um, <clears throat> I think that's all I can talk about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Webb. Oh, Sounds like uh, many, uh, go ahead. No, excuse me, there is, um, we're going to have, I see that Phil is here and so we're gonna talk about the, what's going on in Salem. So maybe I can bring it up then, but uh, there are a number of bills pending uh, which relate to um, timber revenue. And I think we should be taking a close look at those. Um, so thank you. Perfect. Yeah, we can provide an opportunity for Q&A and comments um, during the legislative update. And, and I think since we many of us have been interested in cahoots, but more importantly, the broader picture of crisis intervention and mental health, uh, perhaps we'll put this on the agenda at a, at a future work session and have a, uh, a discussion, a, a little more uh, full uh, discussion of the, of the issue. Commissioner Banks? Um, within that work session, can we invite um, law enforcement representatives from Eugene to discuss um, how it has affected their force and their budget? Um, get get the pros and the cons. Get get information from them. That's a, a good recommendation. I, I think we can take that under advisement, Commissioner Thompson. Indeed, and uh, also the county commissioners in Lane County, um, the, the uh, ones who have most to say about that, I think it would do, uh, offer a more complete perspective. Great. Good suggestions. Um, I might save my board communication to when we talk about the public health update on the second item, just uh, from uh, news on the vaccine uh, rollout this week. Um, I'm, I'll provide any, uh, you know, I'll try to fill in the gaps if there are some, but uh, I know we'll be talking about that uh, after our legislative update. And let's go ahead and roll right into that. We'll roll into our legislative update. And Philip, are you going to be providing that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If that's okay with you. Yes. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, commissioners. Um, just wanted to give a uh, Quick update on a few things. One is you should be seeing in your inboxes today, we've been trying to consolidate all of our, our updates into that newsletter that each of you should be receiving. If you are not, please let us know. A couple people have flagged that it's going to spam and we're trying to work out those kinks. Last week's update should be landing this morning and we just got done proofing that. And so um, 
if there's something also that we're missing that you would like us to include on that, please let me know. We can easily, um, as we're all covering different areas, um, which has been a little difficult. Um, we have more committees this session than we've ever had. And on an any given day, you're usually having about 15 committees meeting, um, about 30 hours of committee hearings. And so we're trying our best to keep up with that um, and consolidating the need to know information in those newsletters for you. So um, any critiques or anything that you would want different, please let us know. We're happy to adjust that as needed. Um, since our last visit, we have met with just check-in meetings with Senator Johnson and also Representative Witt. Just wanted to make sure that we are on the same page of uh, opening up that communication so that uh, while they all have your phone numbers and easily communicate with you, want to make sure that if um, they need us to be Johnny on the spot and jump on something that they know we're available for them. Um, and then also thank you for the adopted, oh, sorry. Sorry, Commissioner, I saw your hands up in the corner, but I wasn't looking up there, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and Commissioner, and um, I'm hoping that Representative Weber is included in your purview as well. We are. So I I, I touched base with her more on education things this last week, but I uh, I will make sure that we're more regularly on all topics with her as well. So let me write that down. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then just thank you for the adopted priorities. We've gone through that and we're starting to adjust as we follow things to the items in that document. Um, I guess I did have a question. Would you like us to, if it hasn't done already, uh, been done already, push that out to the Senator and two representatives? Um, or is that, okay. Kind of getting head nods. So if that's okay, I'll, I'll get those off to them. Um, um, last excuse me. I, I think it would be more appropriate if um, if uh, our representatives uh, received that from us. Perfect. Um, I think that's something that um, that if we haven't already done, I think that's something that that they should hear directly from us about. <laughs> Perfect. All right. I agree. Okay. Um, then I just wanted to move into a couple specific topics. One, um, the Dogami co conversation, we checked in after the initial hearing. Um, they are moving forward with conversations in LFO and they've directed the agency to get LFO information to move forward as a funded agency, not as a con um, an eliminated agency. So ideally, that's still good news. I know some commissioners were very interested in that. Um, but we are still going to continue to follow that in case any hiccups happen. Um, there are, they did flag, there are going to be changes. They don't feel like um, there are, are parts of that agency that are working efficiently. And so we should expect significant changes or a lot of budget notes um, requiring them to do a lot of interim reporting. So um, don't know what those look like yet, but they are moving forward as keeping it as a standalone agency. Um, just also heads up on Foods program. I just want to flag this if it's helpful for you, Commissioner Bings, or any of the commissioners. Um, we do have, and I just want to make sure you're aware, we do have a client, the Social Wor uh, Association of National Social Workers. They are pushing a bill for the CAHOOTS program. They're, they have a big request of $10 million to fund that and to push it out into the state. That's not long-term funding. Um, I, am, I have made them aware of that, um, but just if you need any information, my other colleague works on that account and I would be happy to connect them if you would like that information. So, um, and then just moving forward of what we're seeing this week in budget hearings, uh, we do have the education system budget starting to do an overview. Um, that is what's going to be um, the full, full so focus of that subcommittee. They're just uh, wrapping up phase one of licensing boards um in general government they're moving forward they have not planned out long term yet they're still building their agenda but they just wrapped up state library and ccb or construction contractors board um and then the health uh, human services committee that right now is taking the air in a lot of the conversations of the budget uh budget discussions um they are halfway through their presentation and on that front, they did find out that there's going to be about another $200 million hit to the budget um, due to caseload growth um, for Oregon Health Plan. So 
that's another about $200 million that they're going to have to find if they want to fully fund that. Um, that brings, I believe, the budget deficit to just around $1.7 billion now. And so um, for all intents and purposes, what I'm hearing is they are everyone is holding their breath that a federal package bails a lot of that out. Um, the one being currently discussed would have a reduce that significantly. Um, but uh, uh, devil's in the details, as you folks well, are well aware, what strings are attached and what how flexible those dollars can be. Um, but that is a significant hit um, in the conversations. Uh, I know it definitely uh, was not. Uh, it was not welcome news to the budget writers. <laughs> and so um, will they will have three or four more hearings on Oregon Health Plan in the budget committees uh, moving forward um, and then move to the next agency. But that was the big, uh, big hiccup last week. Um, and then natural resources or some other uh, agents that sees that I know are in the purviews that are starting to have conversations this week for the county is DLCD. They're starting their budget hearings this week. They had their first initial one, but they're going to dive a little deeper. I believe that is on the 17th. Um, and then the Land Use Appeals Board as well, that they have a hearing today. I don't think that will drag into a two-day hearing. I think it's just one. Um, but we will be monitoring that because that was a, a list of interest for the county. And then two, I did get the list of the timber tax um, uh, bills that you had referenced, Commissioner. Um, so these are these are bills that they want to have a hearing on. The, my understanding is on the eight, 16th and 18th, they are going to have an informational hearing in the House Ag and Natural Resource Committee. Um, they're going to talk an overview, bring in all the agencies uh, associated along with stakeholder groups and have an overview of the harvest tax, the timber tax and expenditures, and then a just solo timber taxation conversation. So that is 16th, the 18th, and the 23rd. It's current. Now, I will say those are the dates on the agenda right now. Since they canceled committees yesterday and today, um, they could, what traditionally they do is just move those agendas. So anything that was scheduled would be bumped back two days. As soon as we get those updated agendas, I will uh, update Monica and make sure she has those dates for you as well. But okay. I know that's of interest. Um, I've already gotten something. I, I can't remember whether it was from maybe from AOC. Those hearings have all been rescheduled uh, kind of on a two days later basis. Perfect. OK, I just want to make sure I know that uh, I've not been looking at the inbox as much this morning. And so if that notice has come through, I apologize. I didn't I did not see that. So. Um, but yeah, that my understanding when we were talking with the chairs, though, that what those informational hearings and stakeholder hearings are going to be will change what these uh, these list of bills uh, will be. So they are open for amendment, they are open to be changed, but they are on the docket um, to meet the uh, work session schedule deadline that's coming up in March. And as long as they're on the agenda, they live past that deadline. So um, just giving you a heads up there, uh, we will monitor those and I'll add them to the list. So, um, and then just one last update of what we're trying to do here is, so as soon as we get those updated agendas, we've gone through and received all of the bill priority reviews that you folks have done. Um, I'm updating that. And then moving forward on these calls, ideally I'll have to Monica a list of those priority ones, twos and threes that have hearings scheduled. I don't want to monopolize your time and talk about bills that don't have a hearing scheduled or moving forward. So we try to keep that list as uh, nimble and narrow as as can be for you. Um, but we'll at least bring it to your purview and ask, do you want us to engage? Do you, um, do you want us to be testifying or submitting written response? So that will be kind of the structure of the updates I give in the future if that's helpful for you. Um, but I'm also open to any suggestions um, if you don't like that approach. So. That is uh, the update we have right now. So a lot of stuff's uh, happening, but not a lot of stuff is moving. I think there's only been about 10 bills that have actually passed out of a committee. There's a lot of hearings, but just nothing's moving. Um, we are hearing from committee chairs that they are, uh, the what they traditionally in a public hearing, they can get three or four panels moving through. 
just with technology, they're bogged down to maybe one or two panels. Things are carrying over to two days. They're running out of time in their work plans, which could be good um, because a lot of bad bills probably won't move forward, but they are starting to cut the list down of what bills they expect to pass. And so um, I, uh, that could be a blessing or a curse, depending on your view, so. So I guess I, if anyone had any questions, I wanted to be a bit, uh, leave some time for questions as well. Well, I wanted to bring put one thing on your radar, and I haven't talked this with the rest of the commission about this, but when I was in Warrington, a lot of effort was done to secure financing for levy projects and levy improvements. And there are two uh, bills currently, in, one in the House and one in the Senate, which is uh, through Business Oregon that would provide uh, $10 million for levy improvements um, for dike around the state. And uh, one is House Bill 2885, and that's um, before the House Committee on Veterans and Emergency Management this Thursday. So we're actually taking testimony in the afternoon on Thursday. And then there's Senate Bill uh, 622, which I don't think is scheduled for a hearing yet. Um, but I, I, I think that if, I, I know that Multnomah County Drainage District is very active in this and they put together some really good letters of support, talking points and materials. And so um, I'm expecting to get some from them and I'm, I'd like to share it with the commission. And if everybody's in agreement, maybe we can sign a letter of support uh, for the, the Thursday uh, committee hearing. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to hear you talk about this. I've raised this issue from the dais in years previous and not had um, a, a united response from the commissioners. I hope we can support this public safety and economic development issue. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner, I guess I have a quick question on the levy funding. I know that there's also a program in Business Oregon, and just given the recommended budget they rolled out um, from the governor's office, do we need to push separate for the title gate um, grant funding as well as a separate thing from levy, or is there a one's better the than gate? the other? The tide gate, yes. Yeah, so that's separate, um, and yes, we would need to do that then I think it's important to support that as well. Okay. okay. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you. One last thing. Um, I had a, a conversation briefly with Gloria Zacharias from Business Oregon with the Seismic Grant and Rehabilitation Fund. Um, I'm hoping that the agency uh, is fully funded in that regard so that Clatsop County public safety and schools have funds available for seismic rehabilitation grants. Commissioner, I'm meeting with Chris Cummings on Wednesday of this week, well, well tomorrow, uh, what do you call it, to talk on another issue, but I'll check in on those programs. He's the interim director until the new one steps in, but I'll check in on that, so. Thank you, I'm grateful. Any other questions, comments? Commissioner um. Webb. No, I just I thought you might have I something to like, say. Look like I you looked like you were going to say something. <laughs> I thought I was too, <laughs> but I couldn't get it out. No, I'm um. I'm wondering actually um, if there isn't something um, that we could do in terms of a discussion um, about uh, about some of these um, timber bills. Um, they are um, it's I think it's kind of interesting the way the committee has has decided to break them up. Um, and um, at the last AOC uh, Natural Resources Committee, uh, there it was. There was a what is very often the case uh, at, at AOC. Th there was a, 
uh, a, uh, what's the word, a reluctance to uh, go um, either, uh, not a reluctance, excuse me, there was a failure for the, for the folks on the committee to agree to a compromise between what I usually characterize as kind of the Eastern Oregon timber issues and the Western Oregon timber issues. Um, and so it's not clear to me um, how AOC is going to land on these. So I think it's important for us um, to, first of all, understand them. There's some, there's some really, uh, a couple of really interesting uh, tax measures um, that I think could do a lot to, um, to bring stability to our, uh, to our timber funds. Uh, and so um, it, it's just, is, I, I, I'm sorry, on my screen, is, is Don here? Don, of course, is here. Yeah, is our county manager here? Yeah, I think he's here. There he is. Oh, there he is. There he is. Okay. Yeah. It, it, would that be possible, county manager, for us to, I don't know, get some more information, have have another work session, or these are these are moving really quickly, you know. So we've only got a couple of weeks to hustle here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so certainly, uh, Commissioner Webb, it's it's up to, you know to the board, but we have the next work session is scheduled for March second, which is a daytime work session, and 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 we can certainly work through that, but that would be the next current opportunity to kind of dig deeper in into those bills, unless we just want to do it in our one on ones um, as we meet in, in in the next week. So, Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm a little confused. Uh, Commissioner Bangs is our delegate to the Council of Forest Trust Lands, and always before that, Commissioner has been the lead person looking at timber issues. So uh, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious about what Commissioner Bangs has to say about this because I'm looking to her to be our commission lead person on this. Can you hear me? I'm just making sure my microphone's on. I can hear you now. Okay. So I have been researching the timber tax issue over the last couple of weeks back in the early 80s, right around when I was born. Um, <laughs> the timber tax um, that is currently being discussed was rem removed, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now, when you're talking about timber, timber is taxed by property taxes, um, it's a forest lands property tax. So, so our private landowners are already taxed while the tree is growing for 45 to 65 years. And then the timber is taxed when it is cut. Um, it is again taxed when it is transported and then it is again taxed when it is sold. So that's currently what is going on. I am researching the why I guess um, I feel like, uh, and this is just layman's terms. It's just an a feeling. It is. I have not confirmed this feeling yet, but I feel like this timber tax is to offset what our future is supposed to look like in our county budget, um, because we have other situations coming down um in regards to the hcp and we're going to have a budget deficit because of the hcp i feel like the timber tax is supposed to offset the hcp deficit and i have a meeting on the 19th that i'm going to attend um that that is going to discuss this further um and i'm hoping to find a little bit more clarity uh my family has been in timber for you know and the last 40 years. Um, and so it's it's not clear. Um, it's clear as mud, I guess, is the best way to describe it. But um, I, I feel like we have to tread carefully because there's a fine line when it comes to our private landowners. And we want them to operate in our area. We want their the funds that they provide. And so if we start hitting them harder there becomes a, a time when it's no longer a good idea 
to operate in our area. It's not financially feasible for them. And so there's, there's a fine line. I have a lot of phone calls in my future here in the next week or so, because this has been on my plate and I've, I've been looking at it for the last three weeks. So I'm sorry, would, Leah, uh, clear as mud. <laughs> would there be, I mean, would March 2nd be too late to have a work session agenda item? It depends on when it, the, when, when these are scheduled to come forward at legislative session. And so if we can discuss it before it comes to the hearings where we have to um, put in comment, I guess, um, it, I don't know with how they've rescheduled things in the last week because of our, our, our issues that we've had um, with the weather. I don't know when this is going to be coming up. Um, does anybody, I guess? <laughs> Yes, we we do. I mean, we know that they have been rescheduled for a couple of days later um, than they were originally. So that's basically next week. Um, okay. Um, do we have a date confirmation? Yes, we do. We um, I have uh, AOC has has all that. I think that's who who sent out the latest email on it. Um, so. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, I think that these, um, uh, Commissioner Bangs, I, I don't particularly enjoy being lectured by you um, on issues that uh, the rest of us are actually quite experienced in. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Thompson, I don't agree with you that the delegate to FITLAC uh, is the person who speaks for the board. Um, we, we had that happen in the past, but I, um, I don't see um, that that's our only conversation through FITLAC, especially uh, given uh, Chair Yamamoto's um, tendency to <laughs> to cancel meetings and uh, not really have FITLAC be a, um, a good forum for the discussion of these issues. And I think it's something that, um, that we as a, as a commission uh, need to quite publicly actually be discussing. Uh, and um, I think these are um, I think these are very important issues, uh, especially for us economically. Uh, we have a lot of uh, special districts to to fund to profit um, from our timber from our timber tax, and um, getting it more established. Uh, uh, and incidentally, the percentage of timber that's harvested in this county on small private land owning land holdings is is minuscule. I, I have the, I think I have the, <clears throat> the amount of it here. But um, this is intended to have large corporations uh, paying their fair share of um, of their impact in the communities that they're harvesting. Thank well, you. Uh, I just know we haven't had a discussion about this prior. I don't remember us talking about it as a commission. Mm -hmm. um, right. I, I think this was the opportunity for all of us, and I value everybody's. Uh, input as we discuss this. I think it's worthy of an agenda item on a in a work session. Um, but uh, but certainly I didn't. And I'm just just speaking from an observer. I didn't I didn't take it as a lecture. I think Commissioner Bang was offering her perspective. I see Commissioner Bangs has her hand up. Go ahead. Um, just to clarify, I'm not taking a stance on either direction in regards to the timber tax bills. Um, I feel like we need to do more research. And on a second note, I do agree with Commissioner Webb that we need to have a respectful conversation with each other in the future regarding these issues so that we can come to a majority agreement. Um, and Leanne, Ms. Commissioner Thompson, I, I hope that I kind of answered your question that you had asked. Um, and unfortunately, it we need to do more research. And I would love to have a private conversation with you regarding it. Uh, Don, you got, can I manage? 
Chair Quayle and members of the board, um, another option just to throw out um, that might be a little bit more timely for, uh, for a conversation is on February 24th, we have another 15 minutes set aside for the legislative update and we can probably maneuver a few more minutes um, so we can maybe try to get about 25 minutes so we can have a little bit um, more of an in-depth conversation. I don't, at, at this point, it'll be hard to get the amount of time, but hopefully we can have some of those conversations um, one-on-one -on -one, and then we can maybe try to get 25 to 30 minutes on the 24th to at least start that conversation and then it can extend into March 2nd if we need it to. So that's another option. I like that personally. Commissioner Banks? Um, could we get a private landowner and possibly ODF um, to, to give us their thoughts? Um, I feel like we need to we need to have information from both private and state in order to to be informed thoroughly in regards to this topic. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that. Commissioner uh, um, Banks, we will uh, talk about who that might be and how best to approach it. It is a, uh, it's a technical topic and uh, we will talk about how we can support your, your board's information uh, to have you feel as prepared as possible as we move forward. Thank you. Do we have any more for Philip? Well, we really appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you very much for, for representing us. Commissioner Webb? I'm sorry, I have a noisy dog behind me, so I'm trying to stay uh, muted. Um, Philip, uh, has there been any discussion um, uh, about, about doing something with the new business tax that was supposed to fund schools? Um, I heard some rumors that they were thinking of, of postponing it or it, it, can you talk, do you know anything about what they're talking about? Um, there is advocates pushing for the postponement. Um, that is not uh, in speaking with the chair and I will confirm when I meet with her on Thursday on the uh, uh, some other revenue issue. Um, but from what we have heard there, they are set, they are using that revenue to balance the K-12 budget any proposals that would reduce that funding are uh, potentially dead upon arrival. So, okay. um, and so they will be talking about that more. Um, I believe that hearing, which will cover a little bit of that, is scheduled for this week on Thursday. And so I'll follow that as well. Um, there is going to be a, a CAT modification omnibus bill. But again, on those, she has made it very clear, Chair Nathanson, that any adjustments must be revenue neutral. And so um, that is what we are hearing in the lobby, whether you're in business or education or wherever. Okay, good, good, thank you. No well, thank you, Philip. Appreciate all you're doing. And uh, we certainly see you as kind of a supplement. We have great representation in Senator Johnson and Representative Weber and Representative Witt. Um, so uh, we've got a good team assembled and, and appreciate uh, your efforts uh, in working in concert with them. Perfect. Well, thank you all for all the information you're sending us. And uh, if we're ever missing something, please let us know and we'll jump on it. So, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Next item is the public health update. Chair Quillam, members of the board, unfortunately, Mike McNichol is not able to join us uh, this morning. He is out ill. And so, uh, Commissioner Quayle, I don't know if I could defer to you um, for this morning's update, if that's okay. Sure. Well, I, I guess um, the, the biggest news is there is a kind of a consistent schedule that will be rolled out for the vaccine clinics in the next few weeks, all the way through April. Um, the idea is to have two North County events and two South County events. Two of them will be first doses. Second of them will be uh, second doses. Um, and we just got news and I, just breaking news that we're actually going to be receiving more doses in the next few weeks, um, more than we expected. 
Um, so it looks like there could be as many as 700 doses each week uh, coming uh, in the next uh, few weeks. So that's, that's terrific news, fantastic news. Um, the task force is, is ready to administer these doses. Um, and that isn't including the 700 doses, our first doses. So that's not including the second doses, which we're guaranteed we're going to receive those as well. And then, as you know, the retail pharmacies are receiving doses now. Uh, Safeway and Seaside, Safeway and Astoria, and Costco and Warrington all received 100 doses apiece this last week. And they will be scheduling uh, vaccine uh, uh, administer, administering shots um, through their pharmacies in the, in the upcoming weeks. And I think their allocation is to remain at that 100 doses per week as well. So that could mean as many as a thousand doses coming each week to the county in the next few weeks. And so that's just a, that's a huge, huge boost uh, uh, for the vaccine task force. And I just got to hand it to, to Chris Lehman, who's been a great leader of the group. Tiffany Brown has just been doing yeoman's work on logistics and putting these clinics together and making all of the details kind of fit. All, and, and Lucas and Vincent uh, from emergency management have been uh, doing the scheduling and compiling the database. That's a lot of work um, to, to put all of this together. And, uh, you know, there are, I think, 200 uh, volunteers from the, from the community that have reached out and, and wanted to be part of of future clinics and Jane Duncan's been scheduling them and now we've got a consistent schedule uh, for the next month she'll be able to fit people in uh, to work these events it's just a, a huge uh, you know a, a huge development to know that we're going to get a consistent supply so that's 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 the best news I've had a long time with regards to the vaccine task force and I'm just glad to hear it Now we'll move on since we um, are now to the audited financial statements for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. And that's on page three. And I think Debbie, you're gonna be presenting on this? Debbie, your microphone is muted. Or Jennifer, are you gonna present? No, Debbie will. Um, okay. Here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. I'm technology challenged. I've been resisting this ever since it started. So, welcome. So I'm. Thank you. I'm. I'm not going to go through this whole packet page by page. So I've kind of just made some notes of some places I want to just kind of give you an overview of what the the audit report includes and where to find information. Um, Initially, I always start with the two letters which you received. Um, the thicker letter is the um, what we call the communication of those to those in charge of governance. This basically just in, details out what the responsibilities of the county were and what the responsibilities of the auditors what were with regards to the audit. Um, it's it's a pretty generic letter. Um, you know, it, did we have any? talked about if we had any um, specific um, difficulties, which we didn't, talked a little bit about significant accounting practices. Um, it's just a pretty run-of-the-mill type letter. Attached to it is also any of the journal entries that we proposed or any that we decided that weren't material enough that needed to be posted. Um, and then, of course, the representation letter that's signed by, the, by um, Jennifer. Um, so that's that's basically it with regards to that letter. Um, the second letter is um, what we have always called the internal control letter. Um, it will line out for you what is considered a deficiency um, or significant deficiency. You'll notice this year that we didn't, we only had one comment um, and it was something that, that the, um, Jennifer had already, or Monica, I can't remember which now, already knew about um, with regards to the LGIP account, that um, the balance in the account exceeded what was allowed by the state, um, but it had already been rectified by the time we came um, to do our audit work. 
that was it. Jennifer did a really great job for our first year getting us everything we needed. Okay, so moving to the, the booklet, as I, yours is thick. Um, there's a table of contents in there that will tell you where to find certain things. Um, I'm going to just key on, on the financial areas that um, we were involved in. Um, the first section I just kind of want to give a highlight to is the management discussion and analysis, what we call the MDNA. It starts on page four, and this will give you a really good overview of what the financial statements include, both at the government-wide and the governmental levels, um, which the governmental levels would be the fund levels. Um, it has some budgetary analysis in there. It's going to give you some key economic factors that um, are being considered for the future. Um, tells you, it gives you, like I said, it's just a really good overview, mostly um, on the general fund, but also will give you, for instance, on page four, it's going to tell you um, in the financial highlights specifically what your net position was um, as of the end of the year at the government-wide level. And the government-wide level is um, those financial statements that are um, would be similar to what a for-profit business would have. Um, it also will give you what your ending fund balance, total ending fund balance were um, at the government level, which is the fund level. Um, as you move on back, if you go to page 14, this begins the financial statements, the basic financial statements. So the first few pages, 14 through, um, I think it's 16, these are your um, government-wide statements. These are, again, those are the ones that are like for-profit businesses. You're going to see your fixed assets on there. You're going to see your debt. Um, you're going to see compensated absences, any of those sorts of things that you don't normally see at the government, um, at the governmental level. Um, It'll also show you your restrictions and what's been restricted and why um, on page 15 down in the net position area. As you move on back, starting on page 17, uh, these are your governmental funds. So these are your fund level financial statements. These are probably more what you're used to seeing on a monthly basis when there's a financial presentation. Um, these do not include any of your debt. It doesn't include any of your fixed assets. Um, so these are truly just the fun financial statements. As you continue on back, you'll get to the proprietary fund statements, which is for uh, Westport Sewer. Um, and as you move on, keep moving on back, then you're going to come to what's called the notes for the basic financial statements, which starts on page 27. And these will run, they're quite large. I think it goes to page 73. Basically, this is the part of the financial statements that explains the reporting entity. It will give you um, specific details for um, amounts that are included pre in the previous statements, which is that page 14 through 26 place. Um, it's going to give you the detail of the makeup of your fixed assets. It's going to show you, um, you know, cons any constraints that you might have on your fund balances and what those are. Um, talks about your PERS information. Uh, it, like I said, it's, it's just kind of an a explanation of everything that's in the previous pages. And then behind that, beginning on page 74, is what's called uh, Required Supplementary Information. We call it RSI. This is information that we're required to disclose uh, based on governmental auditing standards. Um, this has to do a lot with, um, there's, I think, three statements that have to do with PERS and um, post-retirement um, benefits. Um, it will also talk about, it takes you into your budget, um, the actual numbers for your, for your major funds. Um, this year, your major funds, of course, are always the general fund, and then also general roads and 4-H. So you'll see statements in here that will show your original budget, your final budget, and then the um, variance between what your actual numbers and what your budget was. As you keep moving through there, you'll get to what they call other supplementary information. This will include your combining statements, um, which will combine all the funds that were considered non-major that are being disclosed up in the front on your governmental statements. 
We'll also go through and do a budget to actual for each one of those funds so that everything is being presented so you can see how you did versus your budget. Uh, after that is the, the statistical section, which Jennifer did all the work for. Um, these are statistical um, schedules that are um, necessary when applying for the CAFR through the GFOA. Um, and so th these are all um, things that, sh that she's been maintaining and, and gets the information updated for us each year. And then the last couple sections, um, the next section has to do with the OMS letter, which is the Oregon Minimum Standards. Um, there were no findings in the Oregon Minimum Standards other than the, the LGIP um, having too much in it at the time. Um, we have to disclose it, but again, like I said, it was already corrected before we came for the final audit work. And then the last section just has to do with the single audit. Um, this is an uh, additional testing that's required because you re um, expend funds in excess of, um, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, $750,000. Um, so it, it breaks out all your federal funds by um, the CFDA numbers so that you can see exactly where those funds are coming from and where they've been spent. And I think that's pretty much all that I had. I don't know if you've had time to look through them. I know the audit report was a little late this year. We're hoping that doesn't occur again next year. <laughs> and we're hoping next year will be the last year we have to worry about the Classified Housing Authority. <laughs> but if you have questions, I'd, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Any questions for Debbie? Well, you answered everything. Perfect. Oh, no, somebody has their hand raised. Oh, no, Commissioner Thompson's got a question. Well, I, I just want to say, explain why I don't have questions this year. I've gone through this thing with a fine-tooth comb and put post-its <laughs> on practically every other page. Um, so all my questions have been satisfied. They've been raised and answered repeatedly through the years. So establish credibility with me, and that's why I have no questions this year. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> we try hard. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. And we will see Jennifer in July again. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So next we have the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget process. Monica is here. I, I apologize if I turn off my camera, but we're having some internet connectivity issues. And so that's why we're all kind of taking turns being on. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to kind of touch base with all of you in regards to the, the budget process. Um, as you all are aware, back in January, at the end of January, you adopted the uh, budget policies and budget calendar. And so now staff is doing their part um, in regards to completing their current year projections. So that way we can figure out um, where we anticipate fin finishing the um, current fiscal year as far as what that would look like for beginning balance for next fiscal year. Um, so when we start um, making those requests for the 21-22 fiscal year. Um, those are all due from the staff by this Thursday, and then they'll start working on their requests for the 21-22 fiscal year, which are due by the 4th. Um, one of the things that as a board, we just wanna to talk to all of you about is we have your direction from the strategic plan and, um, and, and where we're gonna to need to be making some budget requests in the coming year to achieve some of those um, goals that are set out in those tier one projects. Um, but something else is just as individual board members, if there is something that that you are uh, needing in regards to trainings or anything that you are looking for for the 21-22 fiscal year, um, in, a, in an ideal world where we are able to go to trainings again, um, 
what, what some of those requests might look like so that we can budget accordingly. And some of these, these are conversations that um, as you meet one-on-one -on -one with Dawn, um, we, can, we can have those conversations as well. But I, we're just gonna try and keep you up to date as where we're as to where we're at in the process. So that way, if you have any questions um, as we move forward, we're we're able to answer them. And so, really, I just wanted to kind of provide you all with that update and answer any questions you might have right now. Any questions for Monica? Okay. Well, I don't think we, um, I think Commissioner Thompson, you're there. I just don't see you. Yeah, she might be having those same connectivity issues. Yeah, there she is. Oh, Mary, turn off your camera. I don't have questions. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> right. gotcha. Okay, and then we also just included um, the budget calendar again, so you're all aware of those um, those proposed meeting dates. Um, so, thank you. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Monica. Going back to the agenda here, we have the Libraries Rural Outreach, Clatsop County and Law Library Services on page six. So that's me again. Um, we have participated with the um, City of Seaside, City of Astoria and City of Warrington Libraries in their ROC program. Um, we had an MOU with those libraries and, and ROC, meaning the Libraries Reading Outreach in Clatsop County. Um, and as, as I mentioned in this, the, the goal of the program is to be able to have a library card for every, um, every resident in Clatsop County. When you live within the city limits, you get library cards because your, your city taxes are paying for those library cards. When you live in the rural unincorporated areas, um, you're not paying into that. And so this is a way to make sure that um, those, those um, youth are able to have library cards as well. And it's also a um, cooperative agreement that they have to working with the school districts as far as being able to deliver the books out to some of those areas um, since they don't have a, a library, working with the school districts um, to try and, and keep that connection. Um, so the current agreement expired. It was a three-year agreement. And so now they are just looking to extend the MOU for another five years. There isn't any financial um, commitment made with that agreement. The county has um, the first two years, we contributed $5,000 each year. This current fiscal year, we contributed 15,000. And what we will be proposing in the 21-22 fiscal year is an amount of 20,000. Um, and, and that would essentially um, cover, cover all of their costs associated with the ROC program. Um, in conjunction with that, um, Joanna has been having conversations with the um, libraries to talk about possibly providing uh, law library services um, at their sites. And so the county is responsible to have a law library, and we do. It is um, in the basement of the courthouse. It's open for um, a limited number of days and a limited number of hours. Um, mainly because it is a very limited budget and being able to have somebody um, manage that site and, and keep it open for people um, has a significant expense associated with it, as well as the expense for the, um, for the subscriptions for the online services. We, we contract with um, Westlaw to be able to provide this service and, and that in and of itself is approximately $25,000 a year. Um, so one of the things that we were looking at um, long-term when we move the jail, um, we will have to try and find a way for um, our, our inmates who are in custody who have to appear um, in court. Um, they're gonna be transported over here and we're gonna have to figure out a way to hold them someplace. And um, as is the problem everywhere, um, limited space in the courthouse is an issue. And they do currently use, um, there are a couple small, I, I don't wanna call them closets, but um, 
room that are in the law library right now that um, they they do when we're when we're regularly in session that they do hold those inmates in um, during um, court cases have them take lunch breaks and such there so what we are hoping to be able to do is to move the law libraries um, access to each of the city libraries we would um, pay for the subscriptions um, necessary at each of their um, at, at, at a computer terminal in each of their facilities and then we would also be maintaining because there are some 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 people like to use the actual books and then we do have books that we need to keep on hand so we will be finding a space um, either at the courthouse or here in the 800 exchange building to hold those actual books should somebody want to be able to um, check those out but we're just trying to find um, a, a, a solution for several things. One, making the law library more accessible countywide to all of our residents um, and not having such limited hours. And then two, trying to address a, a space issue that we'll be um, running into in the, in the next couple of years once the jail moves. So, so those are just conversations that are currently taking place. And I'll let Joanna speak to kind of where we're at with those conversations, because they're still in the development phase. Sure, we've been working with um, the librarians for each of the different cities, City of Warrington, Seaside, and Astoria. Um, and um, we recognize this as a big partnership um, amongst um, the city and the county. And right now we have identified um, subscriptions um, for um, the terminals. And I think um, with some changes in what we subscribe to, we would no longer be subscribing to Westlaw. Um, we would be finding some cheaper alternatives that would be providing the same um, access to primary uh, materials and then some secondary materials. We think we can actually improve uh, what folks use um, to the public for the for the good of the whole. So we're in that process of talking about it. Um, I have um, a, a meeting requested with the state courts um, to talk with them about the situation. Um, and so it's just an ongoing discussion. Uh, we know that there's not really a time frame on this other than we know that our subscription for Westlaw will be ending um, in the next few months. So we want to have something in place um, when that ends. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, Cannon Beach doesn't have a public library, but we have a library that's supported by membership. Um, Cannon Beach doesn't have a school that's a public school. We have a charter school. Then there's Fire Mountain School, which is just across the line in Tillamook County, but still serves children from Clatsop County. Um, I applaud your efforts to increase literacy legal and otherwise i think that's essential for democracy that's great i'm all for that um i'd like to hear more about what happens to the other half of class of county uh under the scenarios you're presenting please one of the things we're discussing uh with particularly the public library in seaside is having remote access um, for um, those um, uh, citizens in South County. So we are considering that as an, as an issue. I have not approached um, any other libraries except for the three uh, city libraries. Um, so I'm not sure how um, we might um, accomplish um, more access, but we have certainly considered that um, as a um, issue. And Jewel and Napa too. And Westport. So if I if I can say um, in regards to the the rock program, that is something that is done through the through the city library. That's their that's their program and their MOU. And they do have those partnerships with the school districts um, for Napa and Jewel to be able to um, to take the to take the books out to the schools. And so um, I don't know in regards to their relationship with the Cannon Beach Library, but this is um, this is 
an agreement that the cities have based on on their program. So so they do try to work with those um, those students that aren't able to um, to come into the libraries. And then in regards to the, the the law library piece, like Joanna mentioned, Seaside is looking at um, possible remote access. Mr. Webb? Yeah, is it my understanding that um, that adults in unincorporated areas uh, must pay for library cards at the city? Is that do I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, and you know, yes. it, it, in the United States, I, I wonder how many places there are that uh, that people have to pay for a library card. And I really, uh, every year when we do this whole budgeting issue, it, it, it isn't there some way we can find the resources to make sure that that every citizen of Clatsop County has access to a library for free. I mean, I, I just find this outrageous that that anybody I've lived all over the world. <laughs> and one of the things I'm all, I'm always bragging about in America is our free library system. And the idea that someone who lives in an unincorporated area has to pay for a library card, I just find outrageous. And I don't understand what, why there would be such a cost to the system to have more people access it. I, I, I just, I don't understand that. I, I don't understand the, the finances of that. Well, is there a taxing district that would be paying for the library? And then you would be, if you're outside of that, this would be your contribution through purchasing a library card. I don't know how much a library card is. How much is it for a year? I've, I've paid Pelhamut County $75 a year to use their library because Manzanita is huh. closer. There are adult education literacy grants that we can look into. Um, granted, I know that we don't have a grant writer, but adult literacy grants in the past in other unincorporated areas where I've lived have um, served the purpose that uh, Commissioner Webb is discussing is, is allowing or paying for um, the adults that wish to have a library card. Um, it's just something that we have to take the time to look into. May we do that, please? Um, I, I mean, I just find every year we go through this and um, I, I, I just, somebody would have to prove to me that a municipal library would actually incur a cost um, per card given to people who live in unincorporated areas. I mean, maybe it increases the demand, hopefully, increases the demand for their books. But but isn't can't we find money somewhere to subsidize that? I I just find it awful. I really do. I mean, to me, $75, you know, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for people who are out of work right now and, you know, and behind them. I think that it's conversations that we can have. As we mentioned, um, we are proposing to increase $5,000 the amount so that way the youth literacy program can take place. Commissioner Quila is correct. It, you know, the cities are paying the tax and so that is why they are receiving um, a library card for free and that's why they charge those who live in the unincorporated areas because they don't pay that tax. Um, you know, in regards to the strategic plan, these are things that we can can focus on um, as we move forward. Um, if we want to address, look at addressing the um, the library system. I, I I would really like to see us delve into the economics of this to to the real actual costs and see if we can't find it in some pot of money in the county. Um, I know a discussion we'd have to have with the cities. I know in Warrenton there's a library bond that they voted on, and it for the librarian that pays for their for her salary. 
Now, what I'm saying, though, um, is shouldn't we? I understand the law. I understand the municipal library's position. Absolutely. Um, but we, as the governing body of the unincorporated areas, um, I believe we have a responsibility to to our citizens to to have to figure out a way to have them have access to libraries um, on their behalf. Uh, I, I just wish, you know, in the since we're heading into the budget process, uh, let's see if we can find some money. Um, it just. I, I saw Thompson and Commissioner Bangs both had. Did, Commissioner Thompson, did you have something? I just remember that in years past, we've talked about having a, a countywide library system. There was not uh, the political will to find the money to do it. So if we want to revisit that conversation, I think it's perfectly reasonable. On the other hand, the real cost of everything is always paid by somebody. So whose cost, whose benefits? If we're uh, assigning staff that task, I think it's a reasonable one, but there's a considerable workload already. Uh, on the other hand, literacy is a cornerstone of democracy, so let's support it. Commissioner Bangs? Um, I feel like that this is a conversation that we could include uh, the community college in, especially since um, adult literacy is one of their their efforts. Um, and on the hand to follow um, Commissioner Thompson, I really feel like we need to become inventive on where we find our resources, financial resources in regards to adding things, especially when we're facing a state deficit um, of, of one so large. Um, I It causes me to understand the importance of adult literacy and understand the importance of this, but also that we need to get creative. So um, it's just encouraging, encouraging all of us to to look at alternatives for funding sources like grants and so on and so forth in order to do something like this so that it's not coming out of somebody else's budget that it already may be tight. So that's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Banks. I agree, there might be programs already in, play, in place that we need to access. Let's uh, move, the, Commissioner Webb, you had something else you wanna say? No. Okay, let's move on to Public Works Facility Needs Assessment Update. And I saw Dean, Dean Karenin was on. So but who actually, um, Dean is on, and um, I'm just going to kind of kick it off and um, turn it over then to Commissioners Koyoka and Webb um, to, to speak to. But we just wanted to be able to provide a few minutes um, similar to the public health updates for um, the commissioners who are participating in this process to um, to kind of share some information. They did uh, share some last week, and we do have another meeting um, following up the meeting that we had last week um, this afternoon. But um, this is an opportunity for um, those commissioners to, to share any insight that they might have or, or any updates that they might have. Fantastic. I'll turn it over to our commissioners. Mr. Oh, thank Chiyoki, you. Your hand up. Thank you. I'll start, then uh, Commissioner Webb can follow with and fill in the gaps that I leave. <laughs> How's that? Uh, initially, right now, you know, with the uh, McKinsey firm doing that, basically um, assessment and design concept right now. Just more of it is just needs assessment at this point. You know, what does the county need? Where's the direction? How? You know, what type of facility? Uh, functionality of the spaces. What do you really need versus what is desired? That's where we're at in the process right now. Um, it's not, you know, it's not to the point of um, how to utilize it yet. It's just what are the needs? What are the functions of this county? And then, then you kind of define the spaces that fit the functions of our county. With that, though, we're looking at growth. How would you know? How do you anticipate future growth? How do you accommodate that in the design and in the need? You know, um, it's interesting. You know, they look at the support staff of the road crew. You know, 24 staff, but it could bump up to 40. You know, if you're doing uh, meetings or events, or you know, you have some kind of a, a 
a road service or, you know, ice or snow, you have an event that comes up that you need a greater response. You could have more people utilizing that space so that, you know, not just a office area, but locker space, equipment, you know, fuel storage, equipment storage, you know, all those things come into the equation. And that's where we're at in this process is that assessment and needs analysis. Um, Commissioner Webb? I really don't have anything to add, um, except that it's really fun to be on a committee with um, Commissioner Toyoka because um, he knows all this stuff about mechanical equipment and maintenance and things <laughs> like that. And it's been uh, it's been really wonderful to have his expertise uh, in uh, it, it. It really it's it's been fun, and we have a field trip planned for next Monday and Tuesday. Um, we're going to uh, Florence. Unfortunately, it, the only coastal county that we're um, able to visit uh, with a new facility is Florence. And so we're gonna go down there and then we're gonna go to Portland uh, and um, visit some of the newer facilities there to see kind of what creative things other people have done. Um, and it's um, and so hopefully we'll have cool reports back um, after after that trip. That's great. I'm, yeah, I'm glad other. I'm glad to hear you guys are doing that. I mean that helps a lot to to go and, and see another facility and 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 get that kind of concept uh, and vision in your mind. And yeah, I'll look forward to hearing uh, back from your from your trip, Commissioner Toyoka. I cut you off there sorry well it's okay i just saying the the thing is very important too is the the fact that you've got the public works director you know you got ted you got terry the assistant director you got dean the engineer all on this project and they are the ones who you know they're the the working hand of the of the machine no one knows better the needs how the functionality of the public works department than these gentlemen so having them in fully involved and integrated in this process is key yeah I, I totally agree. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, when I hear phrases like um, uh, the going forward in time, so the, the trends and what we'll need in the future, I hear needs analysis. I get this warm blossoming in my heart. I think this is the sign of a true budget nerd. I'm pretty sure Monica is doing the same thing right now. Thank you for your good work. Any further comments? If not, anything from Monica, anything from staff? Is that it? Well, that's exciting. I, yeah, I turn it over to Don if he has anything. It doesn't sound like it. it sounds like the, um, we're moving. I'm sorry. Hey, go ahead, Don. So um, thanks, Monica, and uh, thank you, com commissioners, for that update. Um, I do want to just kind of um, say a few words as we think about all of the various opportunities there are for us to get involved in some planning work as we move forward, because um, whether it's the CAHOOTS project or whether it's a lot of the legislative um, activities that are going to con uh, consume staff time, grant writing. Uh, certainly staff is interested um, in going in whatever direction that the board sends us in and we'll do so happ happily and dutifully. Um, my only thing is that as we go through that is that we always um, are aware of what is on the list of the to-dos right now because um, I am concerned about staff capacity right now and whether or not we have a staff standing um, in another six months or or another year. And so I just want to just, you know, for staff's sake, just lend a voice um, to the fact that, you know, we're already operating at about 110 percent. Um, and so as we add, which we will happily do, one thing that we may have to to do is to revisit the 14 action areas, action items, and maybe recon, re, reconfigure what those priorities are. 
because uh, certainly if if we want to spend a lot of staff time on the cahoots uh, feasibility analysis of research um, that may take that may require us to take something off of the 14 priority list because that's the kind of, of of staff investment it would actually take um, to do diligence to that question and so there's always options. One is some of these items can wait until the next strategic planning process, uh, which will happen next year, and, and we can add it. Or the board can always tell us that something else has risen in its priority level, and we will happily um, re, you know, reorientate our priorities. So um, just as we talk through our one-on-ones, if there's something that you really think needs to be added, uh, maybe we'll, we can schedule that for a work session so that we can have these conversations because with the new jail being built and then all the work we're doing on North Coast Business Park and on the relocation of the public works facility on top of legislative sessions and COVID and I could go on and on, but you all know what the list is. So, um, so just let us know. Um, as we go through this so that we make sure we are doing the, the work that the county board wants us to be doing. So, I appreciate that, uh, Don. I think it is really important that we remain focused on the priorities that we set forth for the year and not go chasing a, a bunch of different directions. Um, but at the same time, we have to be somewhat nimble as things come up to be able to explore those and make sure that those are things that uh, we, we either want to endorse or get behind or, or things that uh, we want to, to save to another date. So it's, it's certainly a balance, but uh, I, I do appreciate the fact that we have a strategic plan in place and that's what we have to kind of focus on this year. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead. We don't have anything else on the agenda, so we'll go ahead and adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day.